Hello and welcome, I'm your code monkey. Here let's see a high level overview on how to make an RTS game. I will cover the basic mechanics for how pretty much any game in this genre is made and how I would build them. And then I will also cover some mechanics more specific to this game that I've been playing, they are villains. It's an excellent game where the clue is actually in the title. You build and defend your base from billions of infected zombies. It's really awesome, I played it back when it came out and I'm really enjoying playing it again. The reason why I'm playing this game again is actually for research as I'm actively planning my upcoming RTS course. This is going to be my Unity Dots course. I'm really looking forward to finally making a game using Dots the proper way. And this genre of RTS plus City Builder plus Defense, this is really the perfect genre for learning all about Dots. So if you're interested in learning all about Unity Dots, learning how to use it as part of a complete project, or if you're looking for a guided path on how to make an awesome RTS game, then check the link in the description. The course page is mostly empty since, like I said, I'm very much in the early stages of planning the course but you can sign up with your email and I'll let you know when it's done. And since that is going to be a DOTS course, it is also going to be an intermediate slash advanced course. So if you want to prepare for it, then check out my C-sharp course that will take you from beginner to advanced. Okay, so here in this video, let's see a high level overview on how to make a game like this. I made a page on the website with links to the various tutorials that I'm going to reference. It's linked in the description. Many of these are topics that I have covered in detail previously. So if you'd like to make a game in this genre, then hopefully this video and all these links will help point you in the right direction. And if you enjoyed this format, then check out my other videos in this playlist where I already covered how you could build various games. I've covered the city builder, turn-based strategy, stealth action, and a bunch more. By the way, there's a sale going on right now on the Synthi store. If you're a fan of their style, you can get tons of packs to make an infinite amount of games. So you can make a military game, maybe some gorgeous dark fantasy, maybe a Roman or a Spartan game. You can make some awesome modular mechs or build a really nice UI. They also have flash sales with 70% off. So right now it's their Apocalypse Pack, then coming on later is the Sci-Fi Worlds, and then Fantasy Kingdom. Definitely browse the sale to see if there's anything that fits whatever game you're working on or whatever game you're trying to make. The link in the description is an affiliate link, so if you buy anything through there, it's the same price to you and I get a nice commission. Okay, so let's see a hell of an overview on how to make a game just like this one. Here is the mechanic list that we're going to cover. So naturally we've got unit selection, we need to do some kind of pathfinding. There's going to be Fog of War, a bunch of buildings, we need to do some resources. We need to spawn some units, handle some hordes, zombie AI, the world map, and so on. So let's start off with the absolute basics, unit selection. This is core for pretty much any kind of RTS game. Usually you can click on the mouse, then hold it to make a square, and basically it selects all the units inside it. This is something that a lot of beginners have trouble with, but it's actually quite easy to do. The simplest option is really with just some physics queries. Inside the physics class you have all kinds of functions. And for this use case the main one is just the overlap box. This one returns an array containing all of the colliders within a certain box area. So as long as all your units have some kind of collider, then all you have to do is when the player clicks, you calculate the lower left point, the upper right point, calculate the box inside of it, and it will find all the units within that area. That's really it, it's super simple. I actually made a tutorial on how to do this in 2D. In 3D it's very much the same thing, just different functions. Then when the units are selected, you want to move them, so for that you need some kind of pathfinding. And when it comes to pathfinding, in most games you usually implement ASAR pathfinding. I made a tutorial on how to implement that algorithm. That one is really great for calculating a point from point A to point B. However, in a game like an RTS, where you have hundreds or thousands of units, calculating the path for each individual unit, that can become really expensive. It is doable, as long as you write some really efficient code. Some of the old school RTS games did use ASAR pathfinding. However, in RTS games with lots of units, one alternative pathfinding algorithm is called Flow Field Pathfinding. This really excellent video by TurboMix Games covers the overview on how the algorithm works. The difference is how in ASAR you usually have a start and end point, whereas in Flow Fields, in this you just have an end point. You define the endpoint and then calculate the direction from each grid position of where it has to move in order to reach that final endpoint. Basically this approach means you only need to calculate the pathfinding once, just to find the target endpoint and any unit anywhere in the entire world can figure out how to get to that endpoint. The only thing the unit AI needs to do is really just follow all the arrows. Which, when you have literally thousands of zombies, when you have that definitely saves a ton of time as opposed to calculating the pathfinding from point A to point B for each individual unit. Then another crucial RTS mechanic is Fog of War. So in the beginning you have no visibility outside your base, and then as you explore you gain some visibility in those areas, and there's usually also two types of Fog of War. There's Active, this one includes what your units can see right now, and there's Explored Fog of War, this one includes all the areas where your units have been at some point in the past. Now for implementing this, as always, there are many methods. For example, I implemented Fog of War in my first team game, Survivor Squad, and the way I did it there is actually in an interesting way. I basically made a grid system on top of the world, and as I was calculating the line of sight for each unit, I would see what grid positions that unit can see, and then I would mark those grid positions either visible or invisible. Then after that's done, I really just had an algorithm that went through that grid system, and then only generated the mesh that only contained all the hidden grid positions. So that's one way to do it, and I got it working with some pretty fast code. 
basically just generating a black mesh on top of everything. And one reason why I got it working so fast is because I use structs instead of classes. I actually talked about that story in my C Sharp course on the lecture on structs. The difference between structs and classes is actually quite important, especially in terms of memory. But another alternative is to use a camera and a render texture. In case you don't know, this is how you can render what the camera sees onto a texture. I made a tutorial on it. The example that I showcased in that tutorial for render textures is for making a minimap, but you can use that exact same method for making a fog of war effect. You can place the camera on top of your worm looking down, and then for each unit, for each building, you add a circle sprite on top of it, and then you make sure the camera only sees that sprite, and just like that, you have the texture with your fog of war shape. Then you can just render that texture on top of the worm, and that's pretty much done. For making the persistence fog of war, you can just set the camera to don't clear, meaning it is not going to erase everything on every frame, so that way the texture basically grows and grows over time. So with either of those methods, you can get a really nice fog of war effect. Then another thing almost every RTS games is buildings of some type that you can place. For this, you simply get the mausoleum position and spawn the building prefab on that location. So in technical terms, it's actually quite simple. Now, one game design question that you have to answer yourself is will your game be grid-based or freeform? Both options are perfectly valid. I've covered both options in tutorials on this channel. It's really up to you to decide. Then for those buildings, those building prefabs, they're going to have some kind of logic. And this can really be as simple as just attaching a script directly to the building prefab. That logic can be responsible for things like unit spawning, resource generation. I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. But the buildings can also simply exist, so just exist, no logic. Like for example, in this game, all the houses, they have no logic. All the game cares about is that the house exists. So there's also a place for quote-unquote dumb buildings in your RTS game design. Now along with that, you are going to have various building types. And as to how you define those building types, the simplest way is really just with a script mode object. This is a really awesome Unity feature. It's how you can define a structure and create objects of that type that exist in your project files. These are great for representing pretty much any kind of data, like for example, building types. I've also used script null objects for defining a crafting recipe, or I've used it for defining weapon parts in my weapon attachment system. So here you can define just a script null object for the building type, and in that object you can store all the resource requirements in order to construct that building and how long it takes to build and any other data related to that building. Then pretty much all RTS games are going to have some kind of resource manager. This is actually pretty simple to do. You really just need to create a resource manager class that stores something like maybe a dictionary to store all of your resource amounts. Then when placing that building, just ask resource manager if there are enough resources to afford the cost. And if so, then spend those resources and just spawn the building. Making a resource manager is actually really very simple. It's all just numbers linked to a certain resource type. And for those resource types, you can once again just define them using script mall objects. Then of course, if you have resources, you need some way to generate them. This is another game design question. For some games, like Age of Empires or Command and Conquer, for those you have units, and those units physically go out and manually gather each resource, so that's one option. In that case, the resource generation is handled pretty much by that villager AI. But another option is like in this game, where the resource generation is automatic. It's really just a simple flow timer that is working on the building logic. When that timer lapses, it just instantly adds some resource to the resource manager. That's really it. Then another thing buildings can do is simply spawn some units. For this, you first just need to handle the logic for clicking on a building, so this can be a super simple raycast. Then selecting the building probably brings up some kind of UI menu. I would handle that connection using an event. So basically when you click on the building, it fires off some kind of event. Then you have a separate UI menu that listens to that event when the building is clicked and then shows itself. And on that UI menu, you can click some buttons to add a unit spawning to some kind of queue. And for sorting that queue, you can use a simple list or an array, or you can literally just use a C-sharp queue. This is a collection that c -sharp has that quite a lot of people actually don't know exists. I covered it in a lecture on other collections in my c -sharp course. This is a FIFO collection, meaning first in, first out. That's exactly what you want for this kind of RTS spawning queue. Then for spawning the unit is really just another simple flow timer. When timer is left, just spawn the unit prefab and give it some kind of preset move position. Next for mechanics specific to this game, we have the Horde. This is the main selling point for this game. How you can get attacked by literally thousands of zombies all at once. In technical terms, it's actually quite simple. The horde is triggered at certain days, so a level designer would define what day spawns what horde. This also means that the game has some kind of time of day system. That can be literally just a simple float increasing on every time of the time. Then it's up to you as developer to define how long, let's say, a day in your game is in real life. Could be something like 30 seconds or maybe one minute. Then as the day takes from one day to the next, at that point you can fire a C-sharp event and have some kind of horde manager class listen to that event and see if it is time to spawn the horde. And for defining the horde data, for that you can literally just have a map prefab, and inside you can place empty game objects to define all of the horde spawn positions, and then you can just link that position with something like perhaps a script mall object, where you define the composition of the horde, 
So how many slow zombies, how many fast zombies, how many big ones, and so on. So the horde is really just spawning tons and tons of zombies at preset points in the level at preset times. So in technical terms, really simple. This is really just a game design sort of thing. And of course, those zombies need to do something, so you need some kind of zombie AI. Thankfully, this is actually pretty easy. Zombies are intentionally dumb, so they are really perfect for making some super simple AI. In fact, this is actually the main reason why my first Steam game, Survivor Squad, why that game had zombies in it. Initially, my goal was to make a SWAT game where you controlled a SWAT team and basically had to breach a house and take down all the bad guys. But since I wasn't very skilled back then, back then I could not make some compelling human complex AI. So after a while, I really just swapped the game to be all about zombies, which greatly simplified the AI requirements. Zombie AI is usually just as simple as having a zombie finds a target and just moves straight to that target. So in this game, that means just follow the flow field that targets straight towards the HQ. And while moving there, constantly look for nearby enemies or objects. For that, you can literally just do a physics query to find all those objects. I spoke about multiple ways to find targets in a previous tutorial. So the zombie really just follows the flow field, and if it finds something in between, then just stop and attack that target. When that target is dead, then just keep moving towards the HQ. So making zombie AI is really super simple. If you have issues with writing some good AI for your games, then the simple approach is really just swap your human enemies for some zombies and just make some simple zombie AI. Then almost every RTS game has some sort of villager or resource gatherer unit. The controls for that is really the same thing as for the soldiers. Click to select and click to give some orders. Now I actually made a video a long time ago on how to make a simple resource gatherer unit. That video is super old, but the logic there is still solid. It is still how I would do it nowadays. The villagers just need to know when the player selects a specific point, and then just move between that point and the resource point, gather the resources and drop them off at some drop-off point. So in terms of villager AI, it's also super simple. Although in terms of game design, it is optional. For example, in this game, this does not have controllable villagers. They do exist, but it's really just a visual thing. You can control them. They just move around automatically. Just to make the game seem a bit more alive. They move around and look like they're doing something, but the resources are all generated on timers. So it's all in the buildings, it's not in the villagers. Speaking of resources, let's look at the map. Now the map has resources like trees, water, stone, and iron. And in terms of creating the map, you always have two options. You can do it manual or procedural generation. Both options are perfectly valid. On the manual side, you just have to manually place out all the rocks and you move all objects. Literally just move the prefabs and place them manually. You can define which of those prefabs work as resource positions. Or in terms of procedural generation, that's an entire topic that I definitely would love to cover in detail in dedicated videos sometime in the future. There are so many possible options. You can do it based on noise. You can just stack tons of noise textures on top of one another in order to make something interesting. Or you can do it based on wave function collapse. This one is a really interesting method while also being relatively simple. Or you can literally just pick a random point in the map, see if it's empty, if so, spawn some resource there. So there are tons and tons of ways for dynamically generating maps. But if you want to create some kind of camping for your map, if so, then chances are you probably want some manually created maps. Then for some kind of skirmish mode for that, you can have randomly generated ones. Then this game also has a really nice world map. This is where you actually pick the next mission. In technical terms, this is really super simple. Just spawn some 2D elements and listen to clicks on them. Then for drawing these curved paths, for that you can literally just draw a texture. Or if you want something a bit more adaptable, for that you can implement a simple spline. Either implement your own like covered in the tutorial. Or actually nowadays Unity has a spline package, so you can just use that one. Then for smoothly revealing the path, for that, you can look at my tutorial for how Hades does it. It basically uses a particle effect in order to draw the path as it moves, and then simply uses all those particles in order to make a mask to make the actual path reveal itself. And finally, the most important thing in any RTS game, which is performance. RTS means tons of units, which means heavy on performance, so this is something you constantly have to pay attention to. If you're making something like a simple adventure game, you can write some pretty sloppy code and it will still run more than fast enough. But on general like this, if you want to have tons of units, you definitely need to keep performance in mind at all times. You need to get really good at using the profiler in order to learn how to find hotspots in your game and then learn how to improve the performance within those hotspots. So learn about, for example, how a 4 is faster than a 4 inch. Learn about how to avoid generating garbage every frame. Learn how strokes can be faster than classes and so on. So you have to learn all those tricks in order to make your game super performant. And of course, speaking in terms of performance, you also have Unity Dots. It requires a different way of thinking. You need to think in a data-oriented manner as opposed to an object-oriented manner. But just by doing that, you get a ton of performance by default. Dots is absolutely perfect for making these kinds of games, RTS games. So if this is a genre you'd like to make, then definitely learn how to use Dots. Like I mentioned in the beginning, definitely stay tuned for my Dots course. Okay, so that's a hell of an overview on how to make an RTS game using their villains as an example. I made a page on the website with all of the tutorial links that I mentioned. Hopefully with this hell of an overview and with all of these tutorial links, Hopefully these can help point you in the right direction for building games just like this. And like I mentioned, the reason why I've been playing this game is actually for research for my upcoming RTS game course. It will be my Unity Dots course. 
So if you'd like to learn how to use dots, how to use it in a complete project, or just how to make an RTS game, if so, then check the link in the description and sign up with your email. I'm still very much in the early stages of planning this whole course, and when it's done, I'll let you know. And since DOTS is an advanced topic, I will assume you have at least an intermediate level of knowledge, so if you don't have that, or if you want to get a refresher, then check out my C-Sharp course. Alright, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.